with the angels of God that just visited the city. That's how wicked and perverse Sodom was. God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, uh, I'm going to destroy Sodom. And, Sodom. and Abraham has such a compassion for, for nations that Abraham begins to make a deal with God. And he says, God, if you could find at least 40 righteous men in Sodom, would you save it? And God says, yes, I'll save it for 40 righteous, I'll save it. And Abraham says, God, listen to my heart one more time. If you'll, say, we, if you'll save it for 40, will you save it for 30? And God says, yes, I'll save Sodom for the sake of 30 righteous men. I'll save the city of Sodom. And Abraham windles God down to 10. 10. Abraham says, God, if you'll find at least 10 righteous men in Sodom, would you save the city for the sake of 10 righteous men? Would you save the city of Sodom? And God says, yes, for the sake of 10 I'll save the city. And God sends angels into the city. They come to Lot's house. And the men of the city rise up because they're so wicked and so immoral, they want to have sex with angels. They try to break down uh, Lot's uh, door. The angels have to blind the men of the city because their hearts are so full of perversion and sin and wickedness. The angels have to blind the men so that Lot's family can escape and we know the story, Lot and his family uh, flee the city. Lot's wife turns back. She looks back. She's turned into a pillar of salt. But my point is, is that God could not even find 10 righteous men in this city of Sodom. And because of that, the entire city is destroyed. We know that from the Old Testament and the account that's written there. But Jesus makes a profound statement in Matthew chapter 11, what we already read, that if signs and wonders and miracles would have been performed in Sodom, that that city would have repented. The city that's considered to be the most wicked city of all the Old Testament would have repented if one, if one believer that was full of the Holy Spirit and power would have walked into that city and held a crusade and said, God's here, the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God is here, the power of God is here. And if that one believer would have began to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, and to raise the dead, according to Jesus' own words, that entire city would have repented and Sodom would still be here with us today. <clears throat> and so here we are. And I think everyone's aware of the events of this week, and I even struggle to even talk about it because it's just all over the place. And to be quite honest with you, I'm so tired of hearing about it that I, I really don't even want to talk about it this morning, but I think that we have to. We have to. We shouldn't expect that the court would get it right because they got it wrong when it came to evolution versus creation. They got it wrong when it came to prayer in public schools. They got it wrong when it came to abortion. And so we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. And so what is our recourse? What is our course of action? Well, many people are calling down the judgment of God on America. and Many people are saying that God is going to judge us and that judgment's coming. And now all these horrible things are going to happen to America. But I have to... I have to consider the words of Jesus when Jesus said that if signs and wonders would have been done in the most wicked city of all the, te of the, all the Old Testament. I mean, you've got to think about this. God destroyed the world at one time through the flood. And he said, this is going to be the sign. I'm, no, I'm never going to destroy mankind from the planet again. This is your sign, the rainbow. But another city rises up that is so wicked, that's so wicked that God once again looks at humanity that he created out of love, that he created in his own image. God once again has to look down at humanity that is so perverse and so wicked that he chooses once again to destroy mankind. And many people think that God wants to do that again because America is seemingly going down a path that's leading us further away from the righteousness of God. But see, my hope is that instead of God judging America, that there will be a people on the planet 
somewhere that there will be a group of people that will look to the words of Jesus in this particular passage and that they will and that they will make a conscious decision to say that no longer will we settle for religion no longer will we settle for religious activities no longer will we settle for just coming to church but there is one answer and one answer alone and that is that the people of God once again receive the glory and the power of God to walk on this earth the way that Jesus did, producing signs and wonders and miracles everywhere that we go so that the culture is changed, so that the mindset of a society is shifted and the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God comes back again to a nation. Because if it was possible for Sodom, I'm telling you this morning that it's still possible for us. So you can call down the judgment of God all that you want, but you're removing yourself from the equation and you're putting everything into God's hands. When God created us and and put everything into our hands so that we would be the answer and we would be the solution to the problem. When Moses comes to the Red Sea and and Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army is following him and they're wanting, wanting to destroy the Israelites because they just escaped from Egypt Pharaoh's chasing them down and he's going to destroy them. Moses and the Israelites come to the Red Sea and Moses begins to pray. And God says to Moses, stop praying. Stop praying. Stretch forth your hand and divide the waters. And this is the season that the church is in. I'm not saying that we stop praying, but I'm saying that it's time that we stop sitting back doing nothing and begin to produce the signs and the wonders and the miracles of God. (sighs) See, there's a lot of things that we don't understand. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, about the spiritual brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And there's a lot of spiritual things that we don't understand. God works through the power of agreement. The Bible says that where two or more are gathered in his name, agreeing upon any one thing, it shall be done, right? God works through the power of agreement. But what we have to understand is that the enemy also works through the power of agreement. The enemy actually has no power. Jesus stripped all of that from him at the cross. The Bible says that Jesus made him a public spectacle. Uh, triumphing over him in the cross. The enemy has no power, but the way that the enemy receives power is through agreement. And see, what we don't understand is that because a act of agreement happened this week concerning a lifestyle, now there will be a spiritual power that's going to be released into the atmosphere of this country because of the power of agreement. That's how the enemy works. That's how the enemy works. That's how he gains territory. That's how he, he gains power. That's how he goes from being a little slithery uh, serpent in the book of Genesis to a big fiery dragon in the book of Revelation because he has to have agreement. Adam and Eve had to agree with him. The problem wasn't necessarily that they ate from the tree. The problem was is that they agreed with the enemy. And when they agreed with the enemy, they took on his nature and his character and his likeness. Man became full of pride, full of lust, full of selfishness. We were never created to be like that. We were created to be selfless like God is. We were created to be love in his image. But because we agreed with the enemy, we took on his nature and his character. And now because of agreement, there will be a stronger spiritual power concerning this particular uh, lifestyle in our nation. We'll see that happen. It will not be too long from now before you see on the news that a pastor somewhere in this country is going to be sued because they refuse to do a gay wedding. Mark my word, it won't be long. It won't be long. So because of agreement, now the the church is struggling to respond. Because see, for the last two decades, instead of the church doing what Jesus commissioned us to do, which was to release power on the earth, 
we have just gathered in the four walls of the church. We've sung our hymns. We've sung our songs. We've listened to sermons, but our lives have never really been transformed. We've never learned to produce the power of the Holy Spirit through our lives. We've never hungered like we should have after righteousness and after holiness. And because of that, instead of discipling a world, we've just discipled in the four walls of the church all the while the world the world has been discipling our children. It's been discipling our society. And because of that, now we have the decision that we have before us. Because the church has remained silent and powerless, That's right. now we have to deal with it. That's right. Because we have failed in our assignment, we wonder why these things happen. We wonder why there's a church on every corner of every street in America, but our society continues to go down this destructive path. The Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin will bring a reproach. Listen, we don't even need the judgment of God to happen. Sin brings a reproach. Sin brings a reproach. We don't need God to call fire down from heaven or lightning down from heaven. Sin brings a reproach. So there's an automatic response because we choose a lifestyle of sin. There's an automatic response for destruction to come into an individual's life because of sin. But it also happens to nations. That when nations choose to turn away from the righteousness of God and follow a path of sin, they are opening themselves up to the destructive forces of the demonic realm and sin brings a reproach. You know, you can think I'm crazy and that's fine. But I see our weather yesterday as a prophetic act of a seasonal shift that has just happened in our, in our country. You can say, well, it just rained all day. That's fine. <clears throat> but I see it as a prophetic statement from heaven indicating that there has now been a seasonal shift in our country. You know, it's going to be 70 degrees today. I have to do a baptismal service. Somebody needs to feel sorry for me. <laughs> Don't worry about the people that are being baptized. They're going to be in and out, all right? They're going to be in and out. It's the middle of June, you know. It's supposed to be 80 degrees. Are you with me? And you can say, well, that's just a natural thing. No, no, it's not. When Jesus was in the boat with his disciples, they were getting ready to go over into a region where there's a, there was a demonic man who was filled with demons, and the demons named themselves Legion. Do you remember that story? And what happened, what happened while Jesus was on the sea with his disciples getting ready to go and deliver this man who was known as Legion? There was a storm. And that storm was not just rain and thunder. That storm was so severe that the professional fishermen that made up Jesus' disciples were fearful for their own lives. It was, a, it was a spiritual indication of what was about to happen. And the forces of uh, darkness were resisting the presence of God from coming into that place and, uh, <clears throat> and that man being delivered. Uh, if, you don't think that the spirit, if you don't think the spiritual forces... Uh, can resist, then just read about uh, Paul when he was in, in the book of Acts. He wanted to go into Asia, and the Bible actually says that Satan resisted him. So we have to understand that there is a spiritual world that we live in. There's a spiritual world all around us. Our nation is made up. It's a, it's a spiritual culture. And because of the agreement that was made this week, you're going to see an increase in the activity from, these, from this group of people that live this particular type of lifestyle. So what do we do? What's our course of action? <clears throat> because I've seen a lot of suggestions. I've seen people that want to go out and riot. You know, I've seen people calling for the judgment of God. But I do believe that there is a solution. There is a solution. And the solution is, is that the church of Jesus Christ finally gets hungry enough. I mean, how dark does it have to get, church? 
How dark does it have to get before we make a decision to be hungry after the things of God? How dark does it have to get before we make a decision to go after the things of God in a way that we've never done before? How dark does it have to get before we are just satisfied with three songs and exiting out of the church at 1130? How dark does it have to get? In the book of Daniel, in chapter 4, I'm going to move quickly. In the book of Daniel, in chapter 4, there's a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is not a godly man. He's wicked. He's a wicked king who runs a wicked kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar was so wicked that God, at one point, has Nebuchadnezzar turned, his mind turned, so that he goes out into the field like a cow and chews on grass. His nails grow long and uh, his skin begins to produce fur. Nebuchadnezzar is so wicked, but in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 3, Nebuchadnezzar writes these words and he says this, How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. This is amazing. You have to think about this for a moment. The Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that? The Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Daniel writes the book of Daniel and he records the events that happened during his lifetime. And listen, an ungodly king gets a chapter in the book of Daniel. Are you guys with me? An ungodly king writes a chapter in the book of the in, in the Bible because this ungodly king had experienced the signs and wonders of God. And that ungodly king says, Listen, how great are his signs. And how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. If an ungodly king like Nebuchadnezzar's heart can be turned just simply because of signs and wonders for God. Then listen, there's no one who is exempt. There's no one who is exempt. Now look at the book of Acts with me. We're going to. Look at a few things. See, what you have to understand is that signs and wonders in the Old Testament were often produced to punish nations. Why, did, why were the Israelites allowed to go free from Egypt? It was because of the signs and wonders that God had performed through the hands of Moses, right? Right? The last straw was the death of the firstborn son. And Pharaoh said, I've had enough. Get out of here. I'm done. I'm done with the frogs. I'm done with the blood. I'm done with the locusts. I'm done with all of that. So just take your people and get out of here. Signs and wonders in the Old Testament were done against nations. But what we have to understand is that when Jesus came and established a new covenant, that, that act changed everything. Now, instead of God being against nations, now God is for nations. Uh, When James and John, the sons of thunder, come to a city where they had refused Jesus, uh, James and John says, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Where did they get that idea? They got that idea from the Old Testament, from Elijah. Do you want us to call fire down from heaven? And Jesus makes this statement. He says, listen, No, you don't know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but the Son of Man came into the world that the world might be saved. God is not in the business of judging nations anymore. Now He's in the business of saving nations. So signs and wonders in the Old Testament were done against nations. But there is a transitional shift in the New Testament where now signs and wonders are done on the behalf of nations. Signs and wonders are done now to change the heart of nations. In Egypt, signs and wonders were done to harden Pharaoh's heart. But now in the New Testament, signs and wonders are done to soften the heart. 
That's a good word right there, Pastor Ken. Amen. Preach it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. This is the New Testament church, and God, of course, in Acts chapter 2, poured out His Spirit. Uh, 3,000 people were saved in one day, and from that point on until the end of, uh, uh, of the Bible... God's people are going around producing miracles, they're producing signs and wonders, and uh, amazing things are beginning to happen. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, uh, it says that uh, the disciples gather together to pray. They're in a prayer meeting, and they pray this. They say, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word by. Everybody say, By. Their prayer was not that we just speak your word. Their prayer was that we speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Paul said in the book of Romans that through mighty signs and wonders, by the Spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel. The gospel is not fully preached when signs and wonders are not produced. And the sad thing is, is that half the church doesn't even believe in miracles, doesn't believe in signs and wonders, and then we wonder why our culture is going down a dark spiral into the middle of nowhere, into death, into destruction. We wonder why. It's because we're not doing what Jesus commissioned us to do, and that is to perform signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is what changes culture. That is what changes the hearts and lives of people. And Jesus made it very clear when He said, if signs and wonders would have been done in Sodom, they would have repented. See, the disciples pray this prayer in Acts chapter 4. They say, Father, stretch forth your hand and perform signs and wonders. But look at what happens in chapter 5 and verse 12. Look at what the Bible says. Chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, and through the hands of the who? Apostles. Through the hands of the apostles. Remember what their prayer was in chapter 4. Father, stretch forth your hand. Do you know how God stretches forth his hand? He comes into the life of a believer. And he empowers that believer with the power of the Holy Spirit. So that that believer, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will stretch forth their hand. They will touch the sick. They'll touch the lepers. They'll touch dead people. They'll touch dead things. And when that hand of that believer touches something that has death attached to it, the Spirit of God who quickens our mortal body, who raised Jesus from the dead, all of a sudden transfers from my life through my body into that death. And he trains, he, what's the word? Transforms that situation and that circumstance. Because I stretch forth my hand, God, through me, stretches forth His hand. Amen. See, we're praying, we're praying, God, stretch forth your hand. And all the while, God's looking down at us and say, okay, stretch forth your hand. <laughs> Do something. Do something. <laughs> through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Many signs and wonders were done among the people through the hands of the apostles. And uh, Daniel Nebuchadnezzar said that his, his kingdom, he said, he said his signs are amazing, his wonders are amazing, and he said his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You see... We understand salvation. We've got that down. We understand that we ask Jesus into our life. We repent. We uh, are forgiven. And because of that, we get to go to heaven. We understand that. But there's a whole other aspect to this Christian life that oftentimes I find we don't understand. And that is when the Holy Spirit comes inside the life of a believer, God actually plants his kingdom right inside of us. Jesus said, don't look here or there because the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. 
the kingdom of God is not there, it's here. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul said the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So when the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, the kingdom of God comes inside of us. See, the goal is not to go to heaven. The goal is to produce heaven here on earth. I'm going to heaven not because I prayed a prayer. I'm going to heaven because the life of Jesus Christ is alive inside of me. And because he's eternal, I'm eternal. I didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. I prayed a prayer to have a relationship with Father God through the blood of his son. And if you prayed a prayer just to go to heaven, I'm just going to tell you, you prayed the wrong prayer. If you're just worried about escaping hell so that you have an eternal home in heaven, you prayed the wrong prayer. The prayer is to have relationship with Jesus Christ. The prayer is to have reconciliation with your heavenly Father. That's the prayer. Jesus even said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. That's eternal life. And because eternal life exists inside of me, my job then is to spread that life everywhere that I go. Lee and Julie are here with us. It's great to have them this morning. A great testimony of God raising someone from the dead. It still happens today, amen? Amen. Raising someone from the dead. That's amazing. Death to life ministry. That's their ministry. Everywhere that there's death. But see, it's not just their ministry. It's our ministry. That everywhere we go, everywhere that there's death, because the life of Jesus is alive on the inside of me, everywhere that there's death, I have the great privilege and opportunity of releasing the kingdom of God into death and into darkness and changing entire circumstances and changing entire uh, situations by the power and the presence of a Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us. But see, too many Christians just pray to prayer to go to heaven. So I'm going to sit in the pew for the next 30 years, sing a few hymns, come to church, leave at 1130, go home and have lunch and forget about God the rest of the week until the next Sunday comes around. I'm going to give God about an hour and a half of my week, and that's good enough because I'm homeward bound. (laughs) Well, you've got the wrong mindset, my friend. You've got the wrong theology. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus taught his disciples. He said, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers. And just after that prayer, Jesus gathers his disciples together. And he says, all right, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to pair you up two by two, and I'm going to send you out. You guys are going out. As a matter of fact, you guys are going to be the laborers that we just prayed about. And Jesus says uh, in verse number 8, he says, Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you. And look at verse 9. This is his commission to them. Heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. Heal the sick there. And then tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. And what Jesus is saying is that the evidence of the kingdom of God, that the evidence of the kingdom of God coming near you is that signs and wonders and healing are going to be produced. He tells his disciples, I want you to go into every city, whatever city you go in, go there and heal the sick. And when you heal the sick there, I want you to tell them that this happened The healing happened, the miracle happened because the kingdom of God is now available to you. The kingdom of God is available to you. Listen, there is no sickness in heaven, amen? We all know that. There's no wheelchairs in heaven. Uh, The Bible even says there's no tears in heaven. He wipes away every tear. Heaven is a joyful place. We know that. There's no sorrow there. It's an amazing place. But see, we've got to understand that the job of every believer, the job description of every believer is to take what is available there and produce it here. Whatever city you go to, heal the sick there and then tell them the kingdom is available to you. The kingdom. Not just healing, not just miracles. All of these things are actually evidence of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God. He is a king. He's a father. 
And his idea was to have a family in his kingdom. That's why we call him father. He's father. We are his children, but we live in his kingdom. And because we live in his kingdom, everything that is there is available to us here. Bless you, Zoe. Sorry you don't feel good. She doesn't usually cry, so I don't think she feels very good today. Jesus said, heal the sick there and then tell them that the kingdom of God is at hand. Flip over one chapter to Luke 11 and look at verse 20. Just a a simple verse. Jesus said, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. If I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And what I'm simply trying to show you is the parallel between uh, miracles and healing and deliverance uh, being connected to the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of God is manifested, signs and wonders are a natural byproduct of the kingdom of God. Why are they signs and wonders? They're things that we don't understand. They're they're things that make us wonder. But they are signs that point to the kingdom of God. We don't understand signs and wonders. And this is one of the reasons why the church, I believe, has gotten away from signs and wonders. We have Pentecostal churches. We have Assemblies of God churches that won't even allow their people to speak in tongues in public anymore. Because they just don't want to deal with it. Well, listen, deal with it. (laughs) For crying out loud. You don't... Throw the baby out with the bathwater. Deal with it. Because this is what happens when we don't. No one's changed. Culture doesn't change. The church grows older and older. It never grows younger and younger because our young people and our teenagers aren't attracted to this boring thing we call church. Sorry to break it to you. And I don't like boring church for that matter. I'd rather just stay at home and listen to T.D. Jakes on the TV or something. (laughs) See, Jesus gave us this instruction and we still don't understand it. He said, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So that is our first job description when we become a believer. Seek the kingdom because the kingdom, it's completely different than this world. It doesn't operate according to the pattern of this world. And when you seek the kingdom of God, all of a sudden you'll realize that what is available there is available here. And that when you begin to produce what's available there here, signs and wonders will naturally follow your life. And people will be attracted to that. People are attracted to the spiritual things of God. I've learned that people are, or more, more people outside of the church are attracted to those things sometimes than people who are in the church. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Signs and wonders. See, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he's not talking about going to heaven. He's talking about this mindset, this kingdom of God, that we actually receive the kingdom. We receive the kingdom. The kingdom is inside of us. But you have to be born again. There's a pathway to entering in to the kingdom of God. And Jesus says the first step is that you're born again. And once you're born again, your job is to seek after the kingdom of God. Jesus said that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. Our job is to be hungry. Our job is to be thirsty. Our job is to be so thirsty that nothing else satisfies except for the water of the Holy Ghost. Our job is to be so hungry that nothing else satisfies except for the bread of the Word of God. Jesus, the bread from heaven who came down to earth. That's your job, to be hungry. To be hungry. God is looking for hungry people right now in this season that we're in. He's looking for a church who's crying out and saying, Lord, we're hungry for more. 
We're hungry for more. We're not going to be satisfied with the moves of God that happened in the past. We want to move now. We want to move now. We want the power of the Holy Spirit to be released now. We're tired of dead sermons and dead songs and dead church. We want something that's alive, that's tangible, and produces power now. But see, the question is, are you hungry? (laughs) Are you hungry? I can't make you hungry. I don't know if you know that. I could have Charlie bring in a big old, you know, big old flopping porterhouse steak with everything that you like on it. But listen, if you're not hungry, you're not going to eat it. And I could bring in every powerful preacher and pastor that I know and even myself preach the best message that I ever preached in my life. But if you're not hungry, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're not hungry. (sighs) Turn with me one last place to Revelation chapter 12. Jesus said in that same chapter, in Matthew chapter 11, where he talked about Sodom, Jesus said that the kingdom of God is suffering violence, that the kingdom of God suffers violence, but but violent men take hold of it, that forceful men take hold of it. You see, what we have to understand is is it's not enough, just it's, it's not enough. It's not enough just to pray a prayer to go to heaven. It's not enough just to have our sight set on that place and not worry about what's going on around us here. Jesus said that violent men uh, take hold of the kingdom of God. And that word violent means forceful. Uh, In in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter uh, 14, it says uh, that, that we entered the kingdom of God through tribulation. And that word tribulation is pressure. It's pressure. See? You know, diamonds are produced through pressure. One of the reasons I think why, why a lot of Christians don't want to enter into the deeper things of God is, listen, it will cost you something. Right. See, salvation is free. Amen. Salvation is free, but you have to understand that the kingdom of God will cost you. Amen. It will cost you your reputation. Yeah. It will cost you your dignity. It will make you say things that are foolish. It will make you do things that are foolish. It would cause you to lose friends. It would cause you to turn off the TV at 11 o'clock and spend the next hour praying. It would cause you to give up some activities in your life. It would cause you to change your behavior. The kingdom of God will cost you something. Jesus said, no man builds a tower without first counting the cost. And a lot of people don't enter into the kingdom of God. They'll go to heaven because salvation is free. But they'll never produce the kingdom of God here on earth. See, I actually believe that people are saved enough to go to heaven. But many people are not saved enough to bring heaven to earth. And that's why the Bible says that when we get to heaven, Jesus will wipe away every tear. There's no sadness in heaven. Do you know that? I used to read that scriptures in the book of Revelations that he'll wipe away every tear. And I thought, well, maybe that means because our loved ones didn't make it or maybe that means this. No, I'm telling you what it means. It means that when we get into heaven and we see what God saw. God's not going to look at Renee and say, Renee, why weren't you more like Moses? Why weren't you more like Daniel? Why weren't you more like David? God's going to look at Renee and say, Renee, why weren't you more like Renee? He's going to look at me and say, Ken, why weren't you more like Ken? Why didn't you become the person that I created you to be? Why didn't you become the kingdom of God? Why didn't you live up to everything that you read about? Why didn't you produce the things that you saw and the, and the things that you read about in the life of Jesus? Why, 
why didn't you live up to it? And see, that's the moment where you and I will begin to shed tears in heaven. It's going to be the only time, but it's going to be powerful enough that you and I will shed tears in heaven and Jesus himself will have to come to us and wipe those tears away because we're going to realize, we're going to realize that church wasn't enough. We're going to realize that religion wasn't enough. We're going to realize that all this wasn't enough. And because we didn't seek after and hunger and pursue the things of the kingdom of God, Jesus himself is going to wipe away our tears because we're going to realize in that moment that we missed out on much of what God wanted us to do. That's true. See, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 John is writing here. He's in heaven. He's having uh, an experience through the Spirit. And John says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own lives unto death. Therefore we rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has, been come, has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. He has a short time. But listen... <laughs> The enemy is raging and he's doing everything he can right now because he knows that he has a short time. He knows that one day soon the trumpet is going to sound. Jesus is going to appear in heaven. He's coming back for us. But listen, let's not look so much to that moment that we forget this moment that we're in right now. And the moment that we're in right now is that we once again become a glorious church that's full of the power of God, that we transform the culture, that we go into Sodom. We go into Sodom. We go into the dark places of this world and we produce the signs and wonders of God knowing that that is what changes a society. That's the only thing that changes a culture. And listen, it has come upon us. It has come upon us. It's our job. This moment will pass, and if we miss it, it will go to another. Listen, don't ever think that God can't use someone else other than you. God will raise up a wino underneath an overpass to take your place. That's right. Amen. God uses the foolish thing of this world to confound the wise, and I firmly believe that God can use a little church in the middle of nowhere, Shade Gap, Pennsylvania, population 101, to change a society. Because that's the way that God works. God takes little Gideon, says, Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Gideon says, who, me? I'm the weakest in my clan, and my clan is the weakest in Israel. God looks at David, a shepherd boy who's out in the field. His own father doesn't even call him to come to the table when the prophet comes. God takes a man like David, and he raises him up to change a nation, to change a society, and to become a king. Listen, Fair Ridge, what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for services on Sunday and that's it? Because you can have it. What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for more of the Lord? Are you hungry to become a group of people that changes and transforms a mindset, changes a society simply because we hunger and thirst after the things of God? What are you hungry for? Thank you, Jesus. Let's just pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless you today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. We welcome you into this place. We welcome you into this place. 
Hallelujah. We welcome you into this place, Lord. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Holy. Holy. Thank you, Jesus.
again. Holy, 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 holy. Just worship the Lord for a moment. We worship you, Lord, you're worthy of praise. And just worship the Lord. The presence of God's here. Just worship the Lord. Father, we're hungry. We're thirsty. More of you. More of you. More of you. More of you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would breathe on the seeds that have been planted, Lord, over the years through the prayers of saints. Lord, from this place, the prayers of saints who have cried out for you. Lord, who have cried out for a move of God in this area who have cried out for a move of God on our children. Lord, I agree with their prayers today in Jesus' name. Lord, we say, send the rain. Send the rain. More rain, Lord. More rain in Jesus' name. Father, don't just flood the earth, but flood your people. Flood your people, Lord. Flood us, O oh God. Flood us, Lord, with the rain of the Holy Spirit. Flood us, Lord, with the winds of revival, God. Let them come. Let them come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Sweep over us, Lord. Sweep over us. Sweep over us, Lord. Sweep over us, Father. We yield ourselves to you in the moving of the Holy Spirit. We yield ourselves to you, Lord. We won't shut you out. We give you permission. We give you permission. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just Pray this prayer with me, church. Say, Father, we're hungry. We are thirsty. We're hungry. And we're thirsty. So we ask you to fill us. Fill us once again, Lord. Let the baptism of the Holy Spirit come. Let the baptism of love come. Wash over us. Fill us, Lord. Fill us to overflowing. Let us once again be alive in you. 
be empowered by you to do what you would do. We need you, Lord. Let us be your church. Not a cheap imitation, but the real thing. The real thing. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. And so this is what we're going to do. I feel, like, I feel like there are many of us in this room today. We need God to move in a situation. We need God to move in a circumstance, whether it's in your family or, or a family member. I don't care what it is. If you have in your mind right now a miracle that you need from God, whatever it is, if you have in your mind right now a miracle that you need from God, I want you to be obedient and come to the front right now in Jesus' name. Would you come? If you have a miracle that you have in mind right now that you need, you need God to move. You need a sign and a wonder in your life. You need a healing, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. I want you to come to the front right now. And for those of you who are coming, I believe God's going to work in your life. He's going to do it very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> there's just a, a, a real strong presence of the Lord that's here today, uh, specifically for signs and wonders in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He's good, that's fine. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 